very much. Welcome everybody to another webinar. This is Dr. Kevin Connors. This is on the not so radical cancer diet, but really on any questions that you might have um, regarding anything, particularly cancer, but regarding anything. We have some questions that um, we had asked before this all started, but please chat your questions in. We'll stay as long as I can and get as many questions as we can answered. Question that came in, hi, my daughter is um, has been diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, and we just had news after surgeries and very strong radiation that um, she's got more nodules and they um, want to do chemo. Um, is there anything you can do from a natural perspective? So Ewing sarcoma is probably less related to diet, but again, any questions are welcome. So Ewing sarcoma is typically found in the distal um, leg of young people. It's a sarcoma that is um, typically fairly nasty. Um, they used to just do surgery and remove the leg. Now they're doing chemotherapy and some other radiation therapies with it. But definitely using RIFE technology, which is frequency technology, which if you followed me for very long, you know that I'm pretty pro on that. And then... Um, dealing with some immune stimulation. So you got to get that person's immune system fighting that cancer. And you can definitely prolong that person's life and give them better results. I'll try to get to the questions that you guys chat in first. So I'm going to have to be taking my glasses on and off because I don't have bifocals. Any suggestions for non-melanoma skin cancers? So there's really three main skin cancers that we're talking about is basal cell, um, and um, squamous cell and melanoma. So squamous cell and basal cell would be the non primary non-melanoma skin cancers. Basal cell is um, very fairly identifiable. Um, people get it on their face as they get older. It looks like a little shiny little flat wart almost. Very common. Um, getting that surgically removed really is a very little concern. Um, and I say that that way because typically if you get a squamous cell or a melanoma surgically removed, you do increase the risk of it spreading. So I'm not a big fan of that. Um, I think you should try to treat it alternatively first if you possibly can, if it's a squamous cell or a melanoma. Um, uh, you can just make the cancer angry and it can spread all over, especially if it's a melanoma. If you have metastatic melanoma, that becomes much more difficult to treat. The um, basal cell, um, you could also treat from a natural perspective too. I've had uh, um, seen lots of testimonials of people that have treated basal cell with essential oils or we use a curcumin type cream with you know high degree of success with basal cell. With squamous cell, that can be a, a much more serious cancer. You got to get into using rife technology. You got to get into working on nutrition and using topical things. Basal cell, typically, it's just using something topical. Melanoma is the most serious of those three. Uh, my daughter in law was diagnosed with cancerous tumor behind her eye. Uh, she went to California to have surgery. She came back to Idaho to have radiation, but the hospital won't do the radiation because they say it is too dangerous. Any suggestions? Well, this, I don't know if this is what type of cancer it is. If it's a brain cancer behind the eye in the in the um, frontal lobe of the brain, but certainly um, sounds like a more serious type cancer. Using as many alternative things along with anything standards of care would be the best results for her. Um, again, I'm a fan of any serious cancer. I would never try to treat without using Rife technology. That's frequency technology. Um, it, it, it greatly depends on what type of cancer it is, depending on what diet you're going to use. Um, since we're talking about diet, if it is a brain cancer behind the eye and not an ocular melanoma or something like that, then um, you have to think about more of a ketogenic type diet. Um, if it's an astrocytoma, um, then you have to, uh, then there's different dietary pro, uh, parameters that you want to look at because astrocytomas tend to feed off of glutamine 
um, uh, quite frequently, but definitely using um, anything that you can to do to help boost the immune system. If it is a brain cancer, that makes it different because that means it crossed the blood-brain barrier and there's blood-brain barrier um, issues that you have to deal with too. And um, that makes it harder for chemotherapy to get in there as well if you're doing a chemotherapy uh, protocol. But definitely I would use the, a rife on any type of serious cancer. Um, and if that's a new word for a lot of you, look up on our website, rife technology is using frequencies. It's not a magic wand. It doesn't make the cancer just disappear, but it helps your immune system target the cancer. And that's part of the problem when you are dealing with cancer. Why isn't my immune system killing this cancer? And the answer is my immune system isn't killing the cancer because cancer is your own cells. And your immune system isn't supposed to kill your own cells. So you need to get the immune system to take a, you know, another and another and another and another look at this cancer to, to choose to destroy it. And frequency technology can help with that. And then anything you do from a nutritional standpoint um, is typically aimed around boosting the immune system to be able to give that T cell um, response to be able to kill the cancer. What diet would you suggest for lung cancer patients? So since this talk is really supposed to be on the not so radical um, cancer diet, there, there, is, there are some cancers that um, are going to respond to different diets on the average. So I made uh, a comment about glioblastoma. You know, on the average, glioblastoma is going to be is going to respond better to a ketogenic type diet. Um, some of the other brain cancers um, can respond better to a ketogenic type diet. But in whole, your cancers can feed off of anything. So cancer is constantly just trying to find a fuel source. So take a step back again. What is a cause of cancer? Cause of cancer is anything that gets inside the cell and damages the DNA of the cell. So inside the cell, you is like literally New York City taking place inside of each cell. That's how much activity is taking place in each of your cells. So um, if things get in there, let's say toxins or chemicals or biotoxins, that can disrupt the different organelle function of the cell and cause health issues, can it affect the mitochondria and can cause fatigue issues and such. That's bad enough, but if it affects the nucleus, it damages the replication center of the nucleus. So the cell goes into rapid replication. That is cancer. So by definition, anything that damages the nucleus in a way that it's going to cause the cell to go into rapid replication, replicating cells that are in rapid replication, that is cancer. So that is a cause of cancer. So your diet has to tie around, no matter what kind of cancer you have, your diet has to tie around partly about detoxification. And then that cancer that is in rapid replication needs a fuel source. Now, Otto Warburg described the fuel source of many cancers. It's not all cancers, but many cancers will use the end play of glycolysis. If you remember um, high school biology, glucose goes through a process of glycolysis and ends with pyruvate and then uh, converts to lactic acid and hopefully converts to acetyl coenzyme A to go into the Krebs cycle to make a whole bunch of ATP. That's how you make energy. So a cancer cell is very dependent upon energy, more so than a healthy cell because it's in rapid replication. So it's highly metabolic. Any, any cell line that's more highly metabolic needs more energy. So it needs that fuel. Now, cancer cells can feed off of glycolysis in the most efficient way that a, that a cell feeds off is through glycolysis than through the Krebs cycle where you make the most energy. Otto Warburg discovered that cancer cells tend to feed off of just the end play of glycolysis, not going into the Krebs cycle through a fermentation type process that's anaerobic where it's actually burning lactic acid, which is kind of odd and kind of inefficient. Um, now, the thought process was that cancer cells are just repli replicating quite quickly, so they need to get quick energy. They can't wait for it to go through the Krebs cycle. Now, what, at least my one of my theories is that 
um, people with cancer can tend to have a genetic defect on the gene that makes the enzyme that converts pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A for it to go into the Krebs cycle, thereby cancer cells tend to feed off of an anaerobic process through lactic acid. It's a little technical, but that's the HIV-1 gene that we look at with our cancer patients. If that's the case, you're going to tend to feed, your cancer is going to tend to feed off of glycolysis, which means, so what does this mean in the bottom line? If that's the case, then you want to be eliminating glucose. So a ketogenic type diet where you're getting your glucose levels down would be beneficial. Um, now, when I when, when I would talk about the not so radical cancer diet, and what, when I talk about we don't want to put our patients on such a radical diet, is that if you take a person who's you know seventy years old has prostate cancer and you put them on a ketogenic diet, how long realistically? Is that person going to be motivated to stay on a ketogenic diet? It's difficult. It's difficult for a 23-year-old to go on a ketogenic diet and to get into ketosis, if that's what the purpose of a ketogenic diet is. In reality, does a person need to do that? Well, some research is coming out that cancer patients don't necessarily need to get into ketosis to get the same benefit from reducing glucose. So reducing your blood glucose really should be our goal uh, on those patients that the cancer is fed through glycolysis, meaning through glucose, through sugar, through carbohydrates. So if that's the case with your cancer, and it can be with lung cancer, but I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes that cancers can feed off of other pathways too. But if it's fed through glycolysis, through glucose breakdown, through the consumption of carbohydrates, if a person can simply reduce their glucose levels, and that's something you could check at home. You could buy a glucometer at Target or something and check your glucose levels, fasting preferably, in the morning. You check your glucose levels. It's 103. That's way too high for a cancer patient. Um, we want to get our glucose levels down into the 70s. That can be difficult because if you're 65 years old and you've had abuse of your pancreas and abuse of your glucose receptors on your cells for, you know, 60 years, it's not easy. You can't just completely just eliminate all sugars and get your glucose levels down. So you got to be patient with yourself. So our comprehensive patients, we give them a glucometer so that they can check their glucose on a regular basis. Typically they start daily, then maybe every three days, then every week, and they want to get their glucose levels down into the eighties, into the seventies, preferably. If you do so, you can very effectively reduce um, the cancer cell's ability to use glucose for energy. Now understand, you're not trying to eliminate all glucose. I mean, you need glucose in your body. It's just elevated glucose where cancer has the availability to snatch it up and use it. Now, I can't say that that is your fuel source for lung cancer. And I can't say that, well, you should just do that. But certainly that's something you should you should consider getting a glucometer. Everybody with cancer should consider getting a glucometer and measuring your glucose and trying to get your glucose down into the 70s, regardless of whether you're going to also um, test for or determine that the cancer is fed off of, of you know, glutamine or fed off of iron or fed off of something else and reduce those things. Um, that would be that would behoove um, that would behoove anybody, even if you don't have cancer, trying to get your glucose levels down. Um, I think there's plenty of studies that show getting your glucose levels down prolongs your life. We talk about heart disease being the number one cause of death in the U.S. still. Um, is it tied to um, uh, glucose levels? Sure it is. That's a tie to all, pretty much all chronic diseases. So something to look at. Uh, ketogenic diet uses meat as its main protein. Meat can cause inflammation, which could cause cancer. Do you still think that's a good diet? Well, I would agree. A ketogenic diet does, you're using, you're eating a lot of meat, and a lot of fat. Um, and uh, a lot of ketogenic diets, a lot of, um, of dairy products. And dairy products just kind of across the board are really pretty much a no-no for cancer patients. 
So um, can they have some butter? Sure. Kids, should they be drinking milk? Should they be even on organic milk, even a non-pasteurized organic milk? No, it's, it's still dairy products, which, you know, dairy is meant to make small animals, big animals in a hurry. So it has growth factors in it. And I don't think dairy should um, be something that's in a regular diet for any cancer patient. Meat. So meat has gotten a really bad rap the last several years. A lot of people are have gone vegan. Um, and vegetarian type diets. Personally, I think that's the, the worst diet overall for overall health. That's just my opinion. Now, some people do better on a vegan diet. So I'm not saying that everybody fits into that category because my philosophy is that nobody fits, you know, there isn't a diet for everybody. So there's not a perfect diet for everybody. My belief is that you have to look at how the way God created us. I mean, there's people out there saying vegetables are horrible for you. Um, you know, vegetables create, you know, chemicals in in them to keep animals from eating them. I just think that's a bunch of baloney. The, the truth is that God created food for us to eat. And anything within reason is right. So I think vegetables are very good for us and contain a lot of flavonoids that are so important for cancer patients. I think even berries and fruit can be very beneficial. But I do think that we are created to eat in season. Now you go to the grocery store, you could buy apples, you know, 365 days a year. Is that right? I mean, I don't know. Just think about it. You know, apples were supposed to be in season. Yeah, you could preserve them in a root cellar for a few months. But you're really eating them for maybe half the year, maybe. Um, and then having that rotational diet, I think is good for us. I mean, you really do any studies on the microbiota and such and the the greater number of different types of foods that you can eat, the better it is. And you look at the blue zones where people are living into their hundreds, the diversity of their diet is the number one common, you know, scenario with most of these people in blue zones is dietary diversity. I don't think meat is bad. Does meat cause inflammation? Yes, if. So yes, if is the is the answer to that. And the if hinges around uh, uh, probably the most common health issue in the world, which is a decrease of hydrochloric, hydrogen, uh, HCL, hydrochloric acid production in the stomach. So your stomach cells make hydrochloric acid. That's part of your pH balance. So this whole idea about, I gotta alkalize my system. Um, that's the, That's the problem with, why cancer is growing because cancer is growing in an acidic environment. Okay, you you know why you know how you actually alkalize your system. You know what you the worst thing you could possibly do is eat, eat something, eat baking soda, or drink baking soda, or drink alkalis, alkalized water because all you're doing there is alkalizing your stomach. And you know how your body has uh, you know your body alkalizes. <laughs> itself, it's through the production of hydrochloric acid, the byproduct is is um, high, uh, is um, sodium bicarbonate that's put into the blood as a buffer. So that's how your body buffers the blood and buffers the tissue is through the process of creation of HCL. But we've damaged our stomach through you know dietary um, antibiotics, dietary pesticides, herbicides, chemicals, food colorings, dyes, all this garbage that we've eaten damages the parietal cells of our stomach, which are responsible for making hydrochloric acid and buffering our body, alkalizing our tissues. That's exactly what happens. So when we have a decreased HCL in our stomach, we set ourselves up for parasitic infections because HCL is the um, primary you know, first response to killing any pathogens that you consume. So you're eating foods with bacteria and parasites. If you have proper HCL, they're going to be all dead. HCL is going to be primary response to help you digest animal proteins. So when people have issues with animal proteins and animal proteins, meat causing inflammation, the number one thing you want to look at is improper HCL production. Most people and, and I'll tell you, every cancer patient should be taking hydrochloric acid with each meal and a digestive enzyme to help support the pancreas. If you do that, you're going to greatly reduce the inflammation 
I'm more concerned about the inflammation that's being produced in the gut, which then is causing inflammation in the brain and the lungs and the tissues everywhere else by um, uh, uh, having antibodies to different foods. Because many cancer patients like, okay, you weren't perfectly healthy and had no problems and all of a sudden you get diagnosed with breast cancer. You had you know, a cascade of health issues that have taken place over your life that maybe were never diagnosed because maybe they were all some you didn't have a lot of symptoms. And then you end up with a cancer diagnosis will pretty much guarantee you that you may have hidden autoimmune issues. You definitely have hidden leaky gut issues, definitely have you know, possible H. pylori issues and on and on and on. So you got to look at all those things and, and try to uncover those things. So um, yes, if a person is eating meat, they're not used to eating meat and they're having an inflammatory response, you got to look at why and, and treat the reason why. Are you familiar with the Rife machine F165? It is recommended. Is it recommended efficient to use? We have availability for this type. Um, yes and no. I um, spoke to somebody just recently that has one of those. I did look it up, um, and um, you know, I that you know, I've tested just about every rife machine on the market, and I've settled on two of them to be the most you know, beneficial, and that's the True Rife and the GB four thousand. The I have never tested this one, so I don't know, and I so I don't want to necessarily comment on that. I will say that if you're treating cancer, you have to be using a Rife machine that's using light frequency. So if you have the GB4000 and you're just using the handheld things, I don't think there's any use, any benefit for a cancer patient for that. Um, you have to get the MOPA and the light, the bulb. Um, the True Rife comes only with the bulb, doesn't have the handheld things. So you have to use light. This is my opinion. You have to use light frequencies. Light is a, is a, photon, so you're carrying that wavelength on a photon, and that particle on that photon, I think, interacts with the cell differently than just electrical energy. So I'm all I, I think electrical energy is beneficial. And when I looked at this machine, I think really, when you're using it with the panels or just the handles, it's really functioning as a PEMF, pulsed electromagnetic frequency machine that you can actually dial in some frequencies, which I think has great benefit. But as far as cancer killing, as far as stimulating your body to kill cancer cells, I think it falls short. Um, but I think PEMF is extremely beneficial for other things. It helps increase cell charge. It can help stimulate an immune response. It can bring help bring overall health. Um, but as far as like killing a pathogen or killing a bacteria, or you're trying to get your body to kill cancer, I think it falls short. Do you recommend eating fermented vegetables for breast cancer patients? So fermented vegetables, um, uh, so yes and no. So there's numerous studies that have come out and they're not actually necessarily new studies that have shown that uh, histamines can be a issue and, and actually the studies I'm referring to were on breast cancer patients, but I think it could be other cancer patients as well. Histamines can be a major driver of breast cancer and other cancers. So you do have to be careful with that. So fermented foods are fantastic because they contain um, probiotics. So you increase the benefit to the microbiota of your gut and your tissues. And what could go wrong with that? Well, the only thing that could go wrong with that is fermented foods also have a lot of um, uh, histamines. And if can if histamine is driving your cancer, well, that could be a big, big, giant no-no. That's one of the one of the main reasons why we look at genetics because you can actually see a person's histamine pathways. And if they have a lot of issues with their histamine pathways, they really should be watching how many histamines they, they consume. Oops. So. Um, you have to be careful of that. Now, if you have a cancer, now, like, how do I know this if I can't go and do a test like you're talking about? Well, you, if you have a cancer like breast cancer that you can palpate and you, know, you can see a response to a dietary change, if you're eating fermented foods and you feel like your breast cancer is improving, uh, it's decreasing in size and you're seeing some improvement, 
then, then maybe that's not your issue and it's not being fed from histamines, then by all means, continue that. Um, more often than not, I see with breast cancer patients, if they eat a lot of histamines, they'll notice an increase in inflammation and not good inflammation. So just be aware of that. Secondly, about fermented vegetables, um, I think you're talking about just generally fermented vegetable vegetables, but there is the issue of fermented soy. So soy, not good for breast cancer patients, not good for any, any uh, not good for anybody really, but soy is, uh, is uh, contains estrogens. It's uh, estrogen disruptors in soy. Soy should not be consumed really by anybody in any, you know, large forms whatsoever. Um, but certainly anybody that has a hormone-driven cancer should stay away from soy. But here's the flip side of soy. The, the research in, out of Japan has found that fermented soy, like natto or miso, um, actually has a beneficial response to breast cancer patients. So understand, hormone-driven cancers, the cancer is being fed by estrogen. Estrogen is just attaching to uh, this certain receptor on the cancer cell membrane and is blocking apoptosis. That's so the cancer is it didn't wasn't caused by bad estrogens, nor is it being fed by aster, bad estrogens if you have ER positive cancer. But that these bad estrogens are attaching to this apoptotic receptor on the cell membrane and blocking cell death. Actually, fermented soy has been found to dislodge these bad estrogens from and progesterones from those receptors. So it can actually be highly beneficial. There's actually a product on the market that we use sometimes with these patients called Highland 951. It's a liquid um, eight ounce bottle, comes in a glass jar, and it's highly fermented um, soy. And you use it on ER, PR positive cancer patients to help dislodge that bad estrogen. Because you could reduce your estrogens down to nothing, but you're still gonna have, you're still gonna have estrogens. And um, the idea is you're trying to get it to dislodge that. So using fermented soy can actually have its have benefits. And I don't think you get the same uh, amount of histamines from that. Ah, uh, what? about methionine restriction. What is a good daily level of intake? So methionine, glutamine, these are amino acids that can be a fuel source for cancer. So um, you this is where you have to be careful. So we do a test in our office. We do a cheek swab test and I test with kinesiology to find out what the fuel source is. And I will tell you, it can change. So cancer is constantly trying to find a fuel to feed it because it's again, highly metabolic. It's sucking up energy. It needs to make energy. So it's sucking up anything it can make energy off of. So methionine, amino acid, glutamine, even um, some other amino acids can be a feeder of some cancers, not all cancers, but some cancers. So if your cancer is being fed off of those, then you want to reduce the amount. Now, you, again, you, you need amino acids to make enzymes. You need amino acids to live. You're not, you're not eliminating all amino acids, but um, what would be the, a good amount um, on people that we found that uh, amino acids are feeding their cancer? We just typically um, eliminate it out of their diet and we don't have them take it in any supplements. Even across the board, I will say, glutamine is a worse um, um, culprit than methionine. And um, I um, suggest people just across the board, you should not be taking supplements with L-glutamine in it um, or any high amount of L-glutamine in it. Um, well, why, why would people take that? Well, L-glutamine is um, a supplement that's commonly used to help heal leaky gut issues. So Many times cancer patients are going to, you know, a functional doctor or chiropractor or naturopath or something like that. And their thought is, well, we got to heal the gut first. So let's get you on glutamine and, and some other things to help heal the gut. Well, that's a noble um, thing to think about. You have to be careful that some things that you would do with a 
you know, heart patients or some things that you do with a, a leaky gut patient or some things you do to help heal other functional issues in a person are not something you would do with a cancer patient. Um, so you, a cancer patient should never, in my book, should never be taking L-glutamine um, because you, if it isn't a current fuel source, if you're taking high amounts of L-glutamine, it can become a fuel source. You're going to be getting glutamine and methionine and alanine in your foods. You're, you have to eat protein. It's, a, it's a very important for cancer patients to eat protein because if you're not eating enough protein, you cannot make the lymphocytes that you need, the natural killer cells and the T cells, the types of lymphocytes that you need to make in order to kill cancer cells. That's what you need to kill cancer cells. And if you have a protein deficient diet, you, you're not going to feel well. You're not going to do well. So that's that's the problem with going on a vegan diet is, is that. I mean, vegans are, are much more prone to infections. This is my opinion, and I don't want to insult anybody that's a vegetarian or vegan out there. So, But if you have a serious disease like uh, an infection that you need uh, an immune response, or cancer, that you need a highly functioning immune response, going on a vegan diet is not the best thing to do. That being said, you really got to watch your amino acid that you're going to find in, in, in supplement products. What tests can I do to find out what the fuel source of my cancer is? I live in Hungary. Um, there aren't any... Um, labs that you could do. So there's no standard labs, not even any functional labs that you could do to find out the fuel source. Um, so we do kinesiology testing, which some people might think, oh, that's weird. I don't, I don't want to do that. That's fine. And if you don't want to work with us to try to do kinesiology testing, then, then that's, that's understandable too. But um, then how do you know? How do you know what your fuel source is if you, if there's no testing? Well, you, you, you have to experiment them. So you you can experiment. There is a, a metabolic um, assessment form out there. You could probably Google it. It's like 400 questions where it asks you what different questions about your diet and your food and your fuel. And then there's a, um, th then you put it through this assessment thing. I think there's even a computerized one out there. That's what Dr. Gonzalez used to use um, uh, to find out what a person's made probable fuel sources, nothing's going to be perfect. And, um, and it can change, remember. So that's what he used to use as a metabolic assessment form and get a pretty good idea what that person's cancer fuel source is and then eliminate that out of their diet. Um, or experimentation. So if you have a cancer where you can visually see or know whether it's progressing or not, uh, like uh, breast cancer, where you have a lump that you can palpate, it's much more difficult if you don't have a way to objectively measure it. Um, certainly, if you have any any cancer, you could do tumor marker panels just to to try to get some objective measurement, short of having to do CT scans or MRIs or PET scans on a regular basis, something less invasive. But um, uh, and then ch and doing a diet and changing it up. Um, I think I talked with Dr. Carlfeld about this too, is that it can be very beneficial to be changed. If you don't know this, to be changing up your diet. Again, going back to what we talked about at the beginning of this, about having um, a diet that is um, that is um, um, changing with the seasons. You know, we, you know, ethically we can get into, you know, a certain diet, you know, I'm from Ireland and, in Germany area, and we have certain foods that we like. And I'm from Minnesota. We have kind of Norwegian type palate. So I've had patients that you know, are Italian and are eating spaghetti sauce and tomatoes with each meal that's high in lectins. And that can cause all sorts of issues if you're eating the same thing constantly. So having a diet that's rotational can be very beneficial. But there isn't any blood test that you could run for that. You said take digestive enzymes. And what was the second thing you should take? Um, HCL. So the most important thing that you can take, when you start dealing with, okay, I got to help heal my digestion. 
it starts from the top down. You know, you got to be chewing your food really good. You need to be breaking down your food. You need to be, you know, secreting talon from your salivary glands to help you break down carbohydrates. Um, you need to be choosing right foods that you're not, you know, causing inflammation. Um, and with cancer patients should try to, you know, reduce dairy products right off the bat. Um, that should be a definite um, thing that you can are considering. The, uh, other tests that you can run to look at foods are making sure you're not eating things that are causing inflammation, running a Cyrex panel to look at gluten and cross reactants to gluten and Cyrex array 10 to look at food sensitivities where you have actually antibodies to different foods. And every time you eat that food, you're causing this inflammatory response in the gut. It's very difficult. Could that be related to your cancer directly? Yes. Um, could it be secondary in a comorbidity? Yes. And that could be a major cause of why a person is doing all the right things. I'm doing all this nutritional things. I'm taking all these supplements to help kill cancer. I'm doing the right, I'm doing all these things and I can't seem to get better. Well, if you are not dealing with some of those comorbidities and you're eating, let's say, let's say gluten as an example, and every time you eat gluten, you, let's say you have antibodies to gliadin peptides, every time you eat it, you're causing this firestorm of inflammation in the gut. Now you're in, in, uh, your immune system is fighting the battle at multiple fronts. It's difficult to be able to kill cancer cells when you're causing this hyperinflammatory response in the gut, damage to the gut, and damage to, you know, other tissues. Do you have do you have antibodies to other self tissue systems, um, like your thyroid or you know, arthritic um, tissues, collagen fibers, etc. So, um, there are labs that can be beneficial to run to find those things out to help heal that. So when you're starting healing the digestive system, you want to find that stuff out, um, but far as supplements go, HCL, you know, with your food and digestive enzymes with each meal is just standard that everybody should be doing um, because just about everybody has a deficiency in HCL production because we've been exposed to so many chemicals in our diet that has damaged our parietal cells of our stomach to make HCL. So if you're supporting HCL production, you're helping those parietal cells heal. And remember what do the parietal cells do when they make HCL? They make sodium bicarbonate to help alkalize the rest of your tissue, which is important. So um, taking HCL is very helpful, helps kill pathogens, helps break down um, your food so that it takes stress off your gut. But if you're eating foods that are inflammatory to your gut, that you have antibodies against in your intestinal tract, you're just creating a firestorm. You got to deal with those things too. And don't, can, don't consider those to be little things and that cancer is a big thing. Well, if you want to heal from the cancer, you need to heal from those things. Um, doing chemotherapy, doing radiation, doing immunotherapy, that damages your gut uh, epithelial cells too, and causes leaky gut issues, um, and can cause, um, that can be a major cause of you creating antibodies to different foods that are good, healthy foods. So, um, getting those tests done can be really helpful. If you join our course, our Stop Fighting Cancer course, or our autoimmune course, I have a bunch of courses. If you look at our website, if you join those, one of those courses, they're only 200 bucks to join a course. It's just ridiculous for you not to do that. Um, then you could actually order labs from the course. Um, the Cyrex panel is the thing to do. Actually, I'm going to give you, everybody that's on this call is going to get an option to make a, do a case review with me. Um, so a case review is is that initial call with me. It, so I don't care if you live in Hungary or California or you live across the street, it's still over the phone or over Zoom. And we could talk about your condition and I could give you some direction and I'll be honest with you. So we're given that, I think, Tess, I think we're doing it for $99 or something, which is like 60% off. Um, and it's 30 minute call with me and we'll discuss your condition and I'll give you a direction. Um, and hopefully 
just listening to me here, you'll know, I'll be honest with you. So, um, but I think everybody should do our course just so you have the ability to run some labs and to, to dig a little bit deeper in your body to see what other things could be going on. You know, comor people ignore comorbidities with cancer because they think, well, I got cancer, I got to deal with this right now. But you you deal you do need to deal with those things too. Um, um, to deal with other causes of inflammation. Do you recommend taking pectisol C, C daily and also iodine, both for prevention and if someone has some type of cancer? Uh, pectisol C, <clears throat> I'd say, yeah, everybody could take pectisol C, but there's probably a hundred supplements that everybody could take, you know? So um, I think too many supplements can be hard on your liver. Now, pectisol C is not something that would be hard on your liver um, because you're really not detoxifying that through your liver pathways. It's not like, but pectisol C can also be a mild chelator. So even if someone doesn't have cancer, pectisol C could be good. So I'd, that would be something that could be on the yes list. Iodide, no. <laughs> so if you want to learn a lot about iodine, you could, I have several videos on iodine. I know there's some books on iodine that are all pro-iodine. Everybody should be taking iodine. Um, I'm just totally against that. And the reason is, is the research coming out uh, uh, that has shown that iodine is a exogenous iodine. I mean, you, we get iodine in our food, right? If you're taking exogenous iodine, I mean, iodine in supplement form, which is typically potassium iodide, um, you are greatly increasing your risk for creating antibodies to your thyroid. Um, iodine is going to be sucked up by your thyroid. It's going to create an immune response to your thyroid. Matter of fact, there was a study out of Japan that showed, I think they had 300 plus uh, people with primary hypothyroidism. That means they had low thyroid, but no antibodies to the thyroid. TPO antibodies were negative. Thyroglobulin antibodies were negative. Um, they started them on iodine because that has kind of been the functional way. Everybody should be taking iodine. All women, you need to be taking iodine. Iodine deficiency is the problem with the thyroid. That's just that was just completely wrong information. I'm sorry, I just totally disagree with it. It was just completely wrong. Um, they put these women on iodine. Every single one of them, not not sixty percent, a hundred percent of them, within like so many months, developed uh, antibodies to the thyroid. So they all ended up with Hashimoto's. Um, now Hashimoto's versus primary hypothyroidism. That's a totally different ball of wax now. Now you have antibodies to self tissue. Every time you create an uh, immune response, you get a cold and you have an immune response. You get cancer and you're taking a bunch of stuff to kill your cancer. You're also destroying your thyroid cells. You don't want to have an autoimmune disease. And believe it or not, autoimmune diseases are very common comorbidity with cancer patients. Again, you didn't just you know have this perfectly healthy body and now you get cancer. There was other things going on. So I am totally against taking iodine. Matter of fact, every patient that I have, I look at their supplements and I take them off iodine. So um, what do you think about honey, fermented garlic? I have prostate cancer. Um, honey, fermented garlics, like some of the videos you might've seen on Instagram where you're putting honey in garlic. And that's great. That's good. There's, that's good immune response. Garlic is a great immune stimulator. Uh, it's a very strong Th1 stimulator. It stimulates an immune response. Garlic is good for a lot of things. Garlic is good for H. pylori, um, which is a common comorbidity, the most common comorbidity worldwide, period. Um, the most common bacterial infection worldwide common one of the top five causes of heart disease and the number one causes stomach cancer causes prostate cancer etc so yes i think uh, uh that's a great thing so yeah, the only thing you have to be careful with about taking garlic is um if you're on a blood thinner because garlic is the strongest nutritional blood thinner um and you don't want to be thinning your blood too much matter of fact i don't I have had people that have gotten off their blood thinner by they're just substituting garlic. My mom has metastatic colon cancer, which has also gone into her liver, been doing chemo, now struggling with some neuropathy. 
She may not want to do chemo much longer. Any helpful information for combating the neuropathy and any other potential oil effects from the chemo and keeping her healthy? Big question. Sorry. Thank you. So, yeah. So, are there things that you could do for neuropathy? So, um, most neuropathies are caused from diabetic neuropathy, which has to do with elevated blood sugars damaging peripheral nerves. So neuropathy, period, is damage to a nerve. So um, when you talk about chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, you're talking about damage to peripheral nerves because of the oxidizing effect of the chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is poison, right? And you're hoping that it kills the cancer before it kills the patient. But in the periphery, in your hands, in your feet, you have slower circulation and slower rebound of what was put into the tissues through the limb system, getting it back out. So you'll get more stasis of fluid and more stasis of the chemical. Um, in, this, in this case, chemotherapy, you'll get stasis of the chemotherapy drug in the periphery simply because of blood flow. Um, that stasis of that chemical could damage the nerve. So it damages the um, afferent pathway of the nerve, which is the sensory pathway from the receptor back to the brain. And when you get damage of that afferent nerve, you start to feel symptoms, tingling, pain, numbness. Um, that's what, that's what um, uh, peripheral neuropathy is. So it's damage of the nerve, the apheron fibers, because of something, in this case, chemotherapy. Well, what do you do? You have to detox the chemotherapy. Well, how do you do that? Well, there's a lot of ways that you have to do that. So you have to support all the phases of detoxification. And sorry, but I have a course on that. I have a book on that. You can download the book, The, se the Seven Phases of Detoxification. Everybody that has cancer should look at that. So I think that's a free download. So go on our website, look for that. Um, I have a whole course on it too, but um, you can download the book. It's a pretty easy read. But looking at trying to pull that out of the body. Um, so some common sense type things. You're looking at liver support. You're looking at, will the person do coffee enemas to help support the liver and help to stimulate parasympathetics? How are their bowel movements? Are they getting rid of stuff out of their gut? Will they do some chelation therapy to pull the, the stuff out of their body and out of their tissues? How's their lymph system going? Um, will they do saunas to help detox through the skin? So all those kind of things you want to help support pulling the chemotherapy out of the body because it just does havoc. It damages other cells, obviously, like in this case. So that's what you'd want to look at for something like this. And then, you know, you know, as far as helping a person that doesn't want to do chemotherapy anymore, hey, that's probably our number one patients that have failed, quote unquote, the medical system. And um, now they're looking for some support from an alternative perspective. So yeah, you do things that will help stimulate the body with the True Rife machine. It also comes with a foot bath apparatus, the ion pro wave. And a lot of our patients are doing that on a daily basis to pull junk out of their body through their feet too. You said to avoid dairy. Does that include raw goat milk? Yep, it does. So dairy is dairy. Anything that's coming out of an udder is dairy. Some people get that confused with, oh, I should eat eggs then, right? No, that's from a chicken. So that's not dairy. What's your approach on salt consumption? I read that eliminating salt from a cancer diet can restore electrolyte system and the natrium potassium balance. So I do know that Dr. Max Gerson was really big into eliminating salt. Um, so the Gerson protocol was you're not eating any salt and that was really important. And his daughter carried that um, approach on religiously everything that Max had said. And she was, um, and so that I think is still taught in the Gerson clinics. I might be wrong, but I think it's still taught down there in Mexico now. Um, I think that has been pretty much debunked, though. Um, uh, remember, you know, Max, a lot of things that were done in the 40s and 50s and 20s and 
you know, early 20th century were correct. And they were the right thing to do. And big pharma changed it because they want you to be on drugs. Coffee enemas would be an example. Max was also big into coffee enemas. Um, so am I. I think it's really helpful. That has been proven to be beneficial, maybe for different reasons than Max even knew, because it's a, mainly a parasympathetic stimulator. He thought it was just a liver detoxifier, but it works through stimulating the vagal nerve. That's really the benefit of a coffee enema. But salt um, elimination um, has uh, really been debunked, I think, for cancer patients. Now, I will say with blood pressure issues, um, you can have a genetic profile that consumption of salt greatly increases your blood pressure. Those people should be off salt. Um, but not everybody has that genetic predisposition. Um, you can have, you know, high blood pressure and you can have it under control and you could eat, you know, salty pretzels and it does nothing to your blood pressure. So it's not 100% across the board for blood pressure either. I don't think it's, I don't think it's uh, a factor, the same type of factor that backs on. Now, it may be true that we consume way too much salt, um, and that might be an issue, but I don't think that's how you get your electrolytes back into balance. Matter of fact, you could look at a person's CDC or complete metabolic panel, and you can see where a person needs, has low sodium, low chlorine, they need salt. Um, and more often than not, that person's been on kind of a salt-free diet for other reasons, um, and they need to consume that. But everybody's different, you know? That's the thing. You can't say it's the same for every single person most of the time. Do you have any general recommendations for how much fruit someone can safely eat? Some people recommend only um, berries or green apples, but God certainly made so many different fruits. Okay, so from a glucose perspective, um, the fruits that are have the least effect on your blood glucose are the stone fruits, meaning the fruits that have a pit, like a plum or a peach. Um, they can be very sweet, but they have the least effect on your blood glucose. They have the lowest glycemic index. Um, but that being said, the fruits that are more beneficial for a cancer patient are probably the berries because they have the most flavonoids. So the more bioflavonoids the fruit has, the more beneficial it's going to be in general for your health, period. And certainly for a cancer patient as well, bioflavonoids are extremely uh, beneficial to reduce the slime infl inflammation layer around a cancer. So again, I um, tell you know we have a lot of our patients take drink a shake, like a green shake. And I tell them to put frozen berries in there with the green shake to taste. Um, so yeah, well, there's a limit to everything, right? So you, uh, you, you can say, oh, fruit's good for you. So then you're going to be a fruititarian. And you're going to just eat, you know, gobs of fruit every day. Anything can be out of balance. So you have to have a balance per your weight, really. And I don't have a figure of you can have X amount of cups per this many pounds of weight or whatever it is. But you have to use some, just some common sense with that. But I think using, um, you know, there's not as much of a limit on stone fruits. You're going to not going to spike your glucose level and, and mix it up. I, I don't think you should just limit it to green apples. That was another Max Gerson thing that I'm just not, I don't agree with. Again, that was when how many different kind of apples that we had back in 1930. Um, so you got to be looking where the information is coming from. But eating honey fermented garlic, is it okay to eat the honey as well? Or should it avoid the honey because it contains such a high amount of sugar that feeds the cancer? Um, yeah, you're, if any sugar is going to increase your glucose levels. It, it's going to maybe maybe honey. Well, people think, well, I'm, I'm not eating white sugar. I'm just eating honey and I'm eating maple syrup. Well, that might break down to glucose slower, meaning it has a lower glycemic index, so it's still going to break down to glucose. Again, monitor your glucose. Go get a glucometer. They're not expensive. And just check your blood glucose levels. Also, everybody, every person's body is different. You could react differently to glucose. I've had people that they, they were juicing um, carrot juice. Well, that's high in glucose. But I've had people juice carrot juice, check their blood glucose levels. Doesn't do anything to their blood glucose levels. 
I remember one gal, she drank uh, like two ounces of carrot juice and her blood glucose would go through the roof. And she had, did not have antibodies to carrots either because that can be an issue that you have antibodies to raw carrots and that's causing an inflammatory response. It was just really weird. So uh, I don't know the mechanism why that was for her, um, but it's like, okay, you, you just can't have carrot juice. So, um, which was a shame to her because she really liked it too. So, but um, yeah, it, check your glucose when you eat the honey. Yeah, if you just eat the garlic, it's going to be much better for you. Any recommendations, recommendations on how often you should do coffee enemas? Well, my general recommendation is you do them daily, but it also depends on your health. You know, I'm in a state of remission for my kids or personally, I don't do coffee enemas, you know, at all really anymore, unless I feel like, like it was about a, what, six weeks ago, maybe two months ago, I was having some bad gut problems again. I thought, oh, here it comes again. And um, so I did coffee enemas for a couple of days. It cleared up and I don't know, maybe it was something I ate. Uh, but uh, it, uh, uh, but typically a, can a person that's in the throes of cancer, doing coffee enemas daily are beneficial. And again, the reason why you do a coffee enema is not to clean out your gut. No, that's a side benefit. You do a coffee and I'm going to stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. And if that's a new word for you, go to our website and look up parasympathetic. Just search that in the search bar. I have a video on, on helping you understand the sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system and some exercises you can download um, that are just kind of silly little neurological exercises that really help calm the sympathetics and stimulate the parasympathetics. Don't neglect that if you have cancer. Don't neglect that if you have any serious disease. You know, you might think, oh, I, you know, I don't have a lot of anxiety over my disease. You could have a lot of hidden anxiety, hidden anxiety or any anxiety in your body over a disorder um, or for whatever reason. If you have increase in anxiety, you're going to have an increase in your sympathetic tone, a decrease in your parasympathetic tone. Thereby, you're, you're not going to be able to elicit a good immune response. Your immune system is dependent on a parasympathetic reaction and a good parasympathetic tone, as well as your detoxification pathways. All your detoxification pathways are parasympathetically orientated. So if you're in a sympathetic overdrive, you're not going to be detoxifying. I don't care how many you know, you know, pills you're taking, supplements you're taking or whatever, you're not going to be a good detoxifier and you're going to be, you know, sorry, you didn't do that. So coffee enemas can be a great parasympathetic stimulator. I was looking at our collagen powder, which says it has bovine collagen peptides. Is that an issue? Also, there is also colostrum sold in the uh, for the immune system. Seems these products are made of cows as well. Um, yes. Um, so common question for our patient patients is, can I take collagen? Um, that's one of those things. It, I don't know the, the, the amount of amino acids in the collagen, and I don't know how much, um, immune or, um, um, uh, growth type hormone, uh, stimulation is in collagen. I don't think it's that much. I I, I suggest our patients, because some of them are like, oh, I just this collagen really helps me with this or that. Can I keep taking this? I tell them to pulse it. So take it for a week, off a week, something like that. Take it a couple of days a week. Don't take it daily. And that goes with a lot of your supplements. Um, so a lot of people get on something and they stay on something forever. It can be beneficial to pulse your supplements, um, giving your body a break, maybe taking it five days a week and then off on the weekend, something that works for you. Um, for instance, we had a question in our patient Zoom call yesterday about dealing with um, parasites. And I told him, oh, I have a bottle of our um, Paraclear here on my desk um, that I take, uh, but I only take it a couple times a month. So it's like, you know, I, you know, I'm not, I don't take a parasite clearing supplement daily. There's some things I try to take daily. Like I take berberine pretty much daily to help with H. pylori, which is, again, I said that's the number one bacteria in the world and a major cause of 
many cancers and the cause of stomach ulcers, the cause of stomach cancer, um, and a major cause of um, um, uh, endothelial inflammation for your heart. So cardiovascular disease. So, but, and, and I take immune, you know, supplements and different things. So there's some things I take on a regular, very regular basis, if not daily basis, but some things this can be good to pulse. And I would say with collagen, that would be one of them. How about cruciferous vegetables? So cruciferous vegetables, I'm, I'm all in favor of basically all vegetables. The only vegetable for a cancer patient that you want to um, limit would be kale. Now that seems odd because um, kale is supposed to be really good for you. Um, um, and the reason why it's good for you um, is because kale has the greatest amount of nitric oxide in it, um, like four times more than spinach. So kale is really good for your heart. Um, but you don't want high amounts of nitric oxide for cancer. So what, is, what does that do? So epithelial nitric oxide synthase stimulates a pathway called your vascular endothelial growth factor pathway. So that's shortened to VEGF. You may have heard of that. Um, your VEGF pathway is how you develop new vessels. That's really important for heart. So you want to stimulate VEGF pathways for your heart. So nitric oxide is a great thing to take for your heart. It could decrease your blood vessels. It could help um, uh, build more blood, decrease the inflammation in your blood vessels, decrease your blood pressure, and build more blood vessels in your heart. But you do not want to do that with a cancer. Um, kind of a mute point with like a leukemia, but when you have a hard cancer, a solid cancer, like a lymphoma or breast cancer or prostate cancer or colon cancer, you don't want, me, this is where some things that are good for, um, from a functional medicine perspective that are good for you, everybody should be taking this or everybody should be taking this, eh, not for cancer. So be aware of that. Don't take glutamine for cancer. Oh, should everybody be taking that? Because it'll help heal leaky gut. Well, first of all, you got to fix the reason why you have it, deal with all that. You don't just take supplements for it. Secondly, for cancer patients, you don't want to be doing that because glutamine and methionine and such can be feeders of cancer. Um, and then uh, with nitric oxide and cruciferous vegetables, um, the only thing you really want to be watching is you don't take exogenous nitric oxide. That's, I mean, by supplemental nitric oxide or things that will stimulate nitric oxide production in your body from a supplement perspective and from a dietary perspective, it's really kale. So stay away from kale. I mean, you can have some, but just don't eat a kale shake. Dietary suggestions for someone undergoing finishing pelvic radiation and endometrial cancer. So I already talked about dietary things with cancer. Everybody's a little bit different with that and some general things that everybody should watch. As far as... Um, uh, radiation goes. How do I help detox the radiation that I had to have with my cancer? Let's talk a little about that. With our patients, we use uh, homeopathics to help with radiation because it tends to work fairly well. The dangers, uh, positives and negatives of radiation therapy. Positive is it's going to kill cancer. It's ionizing. It's going to kill cancer directly and it's gonna kill cancer quickly. Meaning if I have if I have metastasis to my bone, so I have cancer that is metastasized to the bone um, and I have really bad bone pain, the danger to that is it's almost always gonna be a lytic type cancer now, metastasized to the bone, meaning it's gonna be eating away the bone and cause bony destruction, which the danger of that is that now you could easily end up with a, what's called a pathological fracture of the bone. So the bone just crushes. And that brings a whole bunch of problems, right? So, um, and that can bring a lot of pain too. So even if there isn't um, a pathological fracture, you can have a lot of pain from a lytic lesion and gobbling up your bone. That's where I think radiation can work real well. It can really shine in that because you could hit it many times, just a few times, and you could just stop the destruction. You could kill it. 
Um, we've had patients that had severe, severe bone pain that was just crippling, that they were just dogmatically set against doing radiation. Their oncologist was trying to encourage them to do it, and they just did not want to do it. And I basically had to try to talk them into doing it um, and listening to their oncologist because you could you could get dramatic changes in in your symptoms, like literally overnight. And I can't tell you how many patients that did it and literally the pain was gone within four or five sessions and they could stop. And many times the radiologist, the radiology oncologist was very sensitive to that patient knowing they didn't want to do it in the first place. And though they might've scheduled 10 treatments, they stopped after three or four that had great results. So, uh, but the negative of radiation, especially when you do kind of blanket radiation over soft tissue is that you do, you can actually create cancer. Um, because what is radiation? Radiation damages cells. It's ionizing. That's what it's doing to the cancer. You're hoping that you're going to be able to kill the cancer before you actually cause cancer in other cells. And that's the danger of, you know, radiating these blanket areas, like doing the whole radiating the prostate bed or had the, you know, lumpectomy, you know, you're going to radiate the breast. You could end up with a melanoma or sarcoma or other cancer or lymphoma because of the radiation. So you do want to try to pull that out of your body. We use some different um, radiation homeopaths to help do that, but certainly doing everything you possibly can to stimulate your detoxification pathways that I speak about in the seven phases of detox information book and course would behoove you as well. Okay, so um, someone recommended taking ivermectin once daily for three weeks and also benbendazole, 100 grams twice daily for up to six months for cancer. Any comments? Would it be hard on your liver to handle? Um, I can't make too many comments on medications from a medical legal standpoint. But no, I don't think these drugs are hard on your liver. Um, yeah, if a person has compromised and they're, you know, seriously compromised health and they're aged and they're not, you know, doing well, um, I would maybe if you're going to do this approach, regardless of your this approach, be doing a, a comprehensive metabolic panel on a regular basis and a CBC on a regular basis even monthly to make sure you're keeping up on liver enzymes and making sure that there's not an inflammatory response in the liver. But tip, from a typical standpoint, these drugs are fairly safe. And I think there's um, a lot of evidence that these are safe. There's evidence that these can be very beneficial for cancer. Um, so I don't see any harm in giving those a try. But I think any compassionate uh, medical doctor would be equal support of that. If broccoli causes me bloating, can this still be beneficial in my cancer diet? Um, I'd say no. So if you're if some foods are causing you bloating, same with beans, then you have to look at, do I have a sensitivity to that food? Do I have antibodies against that food? You could have antibodies against good thing, things that are good for you. So doing a Cyrex panel can be beneficial to find out what that is. But just from a food elimination diet, just, you know, historically, I can't eat broccoli. I tend to have a sensitivity to it. You could just have, be have used hard to digest. Again, <laughs> broccoli and beans and things, um, they can be just difficult to digest. So um, why are they difficult to digest? Because most people have a deficiency in HCL and digestive enzymes. So try that. Try taking some HCL and digestive enzymes when you eat that. Try cooking it. Okay, so there's all this thing about raw. Everybody should be eating raw. That's the whole thing because it has enzymes in it. And if you you cook it, you destroy the enzymes. Okay, stop listening to some of this stuff like this. It's a lot more difficult to digest raw vegetables than it is to digest cooked vegetables. There's a diet that we put a lot of autoimmune patients on called the GAPS diet. That's where you're basically start eating broth and not, then you move to eating soup, which is highly cooked vegetables. Make soups. Um, oh, you're losing all the nutrients. You're losing it in the broth. Eat the, drink the broth then. And um, you're not, you know, just eating 
all these vegetables just to get the nutrients. I'll tell you right now, you know, if you don't have a healthy gut and you're eating raw, even juicing, oh, juicing is great because you're pre-digesting it. That's great. You still have to absorb it. You have to break it down into, not into small pieces that you can see. You have to break it down into microscopic pieces that you could get across the gut membrane. And that can be difficult um, for people, especially as we age. And um, so raw diets can be can be hard on your gut. So making things in a soup type form can be beneficial. If you're still getting some bloating and things, you do got to examine other things that could be going on with your gut. Start with digestion, start with HCL and, um, and, and digestive enzymes. Would taking one to two doses of methylene blue five days a week be beneficial? I am also using red light therapy. Well, the methylene blue can be beneficial for some things. I'm not a huge fan of it for cancer patients. Um, we've tested it as a tested well. Red light therapy can be good for some things too. It's not going to be a cancer killer, but I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it for there's other beneficial uh, benefits with the skin too. Uh, someone recommended dandelion root and leaves. Would making a tea of this be good? Absolutely. Dandelion root um, is really good for your liver. So dandelion root, dandelion tea is really um, a liver. It helps with phase one, phase two pathways in your liver. Um, something we recommend quite frequently. Okay, just remind you again to contact our office if you want to have a case review with me. It's normally two hundred twenty-five dollars, um, but um, we're gonna anybody that's on this call or listen to this call, it's gonna be ninety-nine dollars, and we're gonna have a limited time for that. I don't know what that is, um, but you could get the discounted case review if you want to talk to me. You have to fill out the educational form on our site, which gives me kind of your history. If you can send me your labs and all that kind of stuff and list of your supplements, things that could be helpful for the call and could give me more information and more things that we could discuss. Again, it's not a medical visit, but it's a, a, a way that we can get to know each other. I can give you some direction, hopefully, um, and you can get some benefit off of that. That's a, if you want to get started anyway, if you just want to talk to me personally about your problems or your family problems, um, whether you have cancer or not, that can be beneficial. Um, also, please check out our courses. Um, so some people go, I, I don't have money to start with another doctor. Do our courses. I add to our courses constantly. Um, our Stop Fighting Cancer course is um, probably most appropriate for a cancer patient, even has protocols and stuff in there. Um and um, I put videos on there. And I think it's valuable. It kind of goes through my book in, in a video type format in more detail. It's easier to watch. Um, you can jump in and out anytime you want and study it. My autoimmune course, if you don't have cancer or you have people with other comorbidities, that's probably my best course. It's the latest one I did. And those are cheap. So jump on those too. So um, we will get an email out to everybody, hopefully about the discounted case review, but uh, call my office if you need to and set up a time. Um, Dustin said, hopefully we'll get the recording sent out tomorrow to everybody. I hope this was beneficial. Um, you know, I don't you know, know everything, but I try to be honest with everybody. And um, I learned just as much from you guys as you do from me. So I uh, know that I'm praying for all of you um, and um, God has a plan in everything for you and um, just got to trust him in all things. So thanks for being on and we'll do this again soon. All right. Bye-bye.